our message this morning. Anciently and all through the Old Testament, it's very evident that God had a controversy not only with the nations, right? But also with a body of believers. We uh, studied about that in our Sabbath school lesson this morning a little bit. He would often seek to bring an end to the controversy by sending them a message. For example, in Zechariah's day, I would like to have you turn with me to Zechariah. It's in the, Old, in the Old Testament, not very close to the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 7 verses 4 to 11. Zechariah 7 verses 4 to 11. Message to the Old Testament church in Zechariah's day. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye have fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those seventy years, did you all at all fast unto me, even to me? Referring here to the seventy years that they were in captivity in Babylon, right? And when ye did eat, when ye did drink, did ye did not ye eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried unto, uh, cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity and the cities thereof round about her when men inhabited the south plain? And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, show mercy and compassion to every man to his brother. Oppress not the widow nor the fatherless, the stranger nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears, put their fingers in their ears, in other words. They didn't want to hear the word of the Lord. And uh, pulled away the shoulders. Have you ever seen that happen? Have you seen a rebellious child do that? Don't touch me, okay? That's how they were treating the Lord and the word of the Lord. Their fears and the consequences and the consequences in the Old Testament were often very dire. Let's follow on with verses 12 to 14. I lost it here. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 14. 12 to 14. Here's what it says. I'm sorry, it's Zechariah 7, verses 12 to 14. I lost my place here while I was talking about that. 12 to 14, Here's what, here were the consequences. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law. And the words of the Lord of hosts hath sent in the spirit by former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it came to pass that as they cried, they would not hear. As they cried... And I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, that no man passed through her nor returned. For they laid the, place, the pleasant land desolate. The land of Palestine was desolate for 70 years as a result. And often these things happened. And often the message of God's church came to deaf ears. This is often how things went. As God would withdraw his protection? You know, God can never protect, protect rebellion. That's against his nature, isn't it, to protect rebellion? God sent a message in Noah's day. Noah is called a preacher of righteousness. And solid rejection followed that message with only eight people aboarding the ark. Or perhaps out of the millions of people, and perhaps maybe even as much as a billion people in the days of Noah, uh, so, uh, hundreds of people on earth, only eight of them went on, to the, on the ark. Turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, right near the book of Revelation, right near the end of the Bible. 2 Peter, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Here's what it says. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, 
a preacher of righteousness bringing a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that should after live ungodly. So Moses was sent with a message. Moses was sent with a message to raise up a church in the wilderness. We know from the rest of the Old Testament just how that went, right? As you read the Old Testament, it's very repetitive how that went after he raised that church up. And John the Baptist was sent with a message of repentance. And one of the most perverse generations in the history of the world was when Jesus was born. It was really midnight in the history of the world. There was a lot of rebellion around. And John the Baptist was raised up to prepare the way for the Messiah. And then what happens? In John chapter 1, it says he came to his own, and what happened? And his own received him not. Would it be too hard to believe that in these last days of the world's history that God would again have a message for the world? As we think of the time around us, what's going on everywhere? A message specific for the needs of this generation? In Revelation 14, there is just such a message. It's called the message of three angels. It's found in Revelation chapter 14. It's a message to the world from God just before he comes a second time. Kind of not unlike the message of John the Baptist preparing the world for his first coming. Now many of us believe we're living in the end time of the world's history, don't we? It's end time, it's, and this Revelation 14 message is an end time gospel commission to the world just before he returns a second time. And we are the commissioned, the ones who carry this message to the world. Angel means messenger. And all who believe those messages, you'll find them in the, in the, the, right in the very middle, the very heart of Revelation 14. All who believe those messages are to bidden to carry it to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Worldwide message. These angels are symbols. Revelation is a book of symbols, symbols of God's worldwide message before he returns in power and glory. And we've been commissioned to carry that message to the world. These angels are heralds of the second coming, calling the world to decision. For when you get to the end of Revelation 14, you have a description of the second coming of Jesus right after those messages are given. Much like John the Baptist preparing the way for Christ's first coming, and the Bible indicates that a great battle will ensue because there will be a tremendous rebellion and pushback from the angels, from the message of three angels in the end time. Rising up against the message, much like the first century gospel, uh, there was a rising up against it as well. The battle is called Armageddon. You ever heard that word before? We hear it a lot lately, don't we? I hear people talking about this. The final battle between good and evil. A warning accompanies this message for all believers. And I would like to have you turn with me to the book of Revelation. By the way, why do we study the book of Revelation? Uh, let's look at Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 and 3. Here's a good reason for studying Revelation. Uh, some people I've heard say, well, I don't want to go there. It's, uh, it's got some terrible things in the book of Revelation. But notice what it says here in verse 1. Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Now that's disarming, isn't it? If you're thinking otherwise. Which God gave unto him to show us unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he glorified and signified it by his angel unto his servant John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. And then notice verse 3, blessed. Uh, in the Bible, blessed means happy. We could, and we could put happy in here. Happy is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Now, how many of you want to be happy? <laughs> I think in the end time, we need to, we need to, uh, we need to be happy. And uh, so I would like to uh, invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 16 now, where it talks about Armageddon. Revelation 16, verses 15 and 16.
Everybody knows about Armageddon. <clears throat> Here's what it says. Jesus talking. This is a revelation of who? Jesus. It's his witness to us. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered them together to a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. We need to take this personally. We don't want to be overthrown by a surprise. And God doesn't want us to come up to this time unprepared. That's a God of love. Wouldn't you expect a God of love to do that? In Amos 3, 7, it says, Surely the Lord God will do what? Nothing, but he revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets. He doesn't want us to come up short. That's what he wants. There's also a warning to, La to Laodicea about this. Laodicea. We all know about Laodicea, don't we? The good news is that God will have a people in the end. That's the good news. Let's look at a couple of places in, in Revelation chapter, well, Revelation chapter 19, just over a few pages. God will have a people. God has, Jesus has a bride. And what is the bride? It's the church. Notice what it says here in Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. I'm sorry. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready and to her is granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So the church, there will be a church ready when Jesus comes, right? That's good news to me. Let's go back a few pages to Revelation 7 verse 9. Revelation 7 and verse 9. And this is right at the very end, right? Right? Uh, um, when uh, the people have already been taken to heaven. And notice the, the, the great group of people here. Verse 9, after I, And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude. A great what? Multitude, which no man can number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. God has a people. And there will be a people ready when Jesus comes. But notice the pathetic state of the church going into this. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Back a few more pages. Revelation 3, verse 17. He's looking at this last church called Laodicea. Just before all these good things happen, before Jesus comes. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art what? Wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And the remedy is given in the, in the following verses. What an idea. Perhaps not like the passage we read in, perhaps un, not unlike the passage we read in Zechariah about the Old Testament church that was ultimately carried away by the nations into the uh, into the nations because of the rebellion. So this time, in Armageddon, all the world is called to gather to a to a grand Mount Carmel scene. There's a lot to be learned from the Old Testament. Do you know that Two-thirds of the book of Revelation comes from Old Testament examples. Two-thirds of the book of Revelation comes from Old Testament examples. In fact, uh, over 600 illustrations in the book of Revelation from the Old Testament. Old Testament, we call them examples or types or symbols. The book of Revelation is just filled with symbols. And to understand the symbols, we have to go to the Old Testament to find them out, right? What were they like originally? For instance... When the book of Revelation talks about Jezebel, it only mentions her name and some of her, her uh, bad works, but in order to understand that fully, you have to go back to 1 Kings 17 and 18 and read about that woman Jezebel. She was a pretty bad woman. Nobody names their little daughters Jezebel, do they? There's good reason for that. The Bible has a good, good uh, example of that. 
Now notice the full context of our Revelation 16 reading about Armageddon. Revelation chapter 16. And uh, let's read verses 12 to 16. 12 to where we read before. Revelation 16 verses 12 to 16. Here's what it says. Verse 12. If you have, if you have it, say amen. amen. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, if you go to the Tuesday night Bible study, we just talked about this, didn't we? For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, this is what we need to take personally. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now, <clears throat> All kinds of symbols here from the Old Testament. Uh, Euphrates River is mentioned. Remember, this is a worldwide problem in the end time. He gathers the whole world together. Euphrates River, kings of the east. A symbol. A symbol that you would only know about if you read the Old Testament Daniel. Do you think God wants, to, wants us to delve into these things? What do you think we should be studying in these days just before Jesus comes when he's left us a message in his name, his witness? The Bible says, read and hear and keep the prophecies of this book. This is God speaking to us here. And then we find these words, dragon and beast and false prophet, all gathered to a place called Armageddon. Armageddon is a transliteration of the Hebrew word, of a Hebrew word, and uh, Old Testament here again. Hebrew is the Old Testament words, right? Armageddon will be a global conflict, but this end time conflict is couched in Old Testament expressions. Not like the local battles that went on uh, on a limited ba ba basis in Palestine in the Middle East, not like that at all. Because all these people, the kings of the earth, are a worldwide phenomenon in the end time. Um, and Old Testament expressions are used to illustrate what will happen on a global scale. Jeremiah knew about false prophets who were screaming to him that his messages from God were not true. And people being deceived on a grand scale. That was God's church in the Old Testament. Plagued with false prophets. If you want to read about false prophets, read the prophet Jeremiah. Pro false prophets all over the place. Bad information that led God's people astray and they weren't ready. And God came upon them like a thief in the night. Now what does it mean? Don't let this happen to you like a thief coming. You know, when a thief comes to, <laughs> to, to break into your house, he doesn't throw rocks on the roof first and say, ah, here I am. He doesn't do that, does he? He stealthily comes in and takes your goods or does whatever he wants to do, um, sort of unawares. So God's church in the Old Testament was inundated with false prophets. Revelation 13 talks about three characters, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. False prophet in the end time. That's part of this uh, great battle at the end of time. We think we know who they are. And they're all gathered to a place called Armageddon. Megiddo, anciently, was a little valley. It was a mountain pass between three mountains uh, on the west, on the northwest. Um, now let me say this, it was a mountain pass through which armies, battles, great battles were fought by invading armies who came in from the north. Of Palestine. The valley is formed by the rising of three mountains, three mountain ranges. We could call them the mountains of Megiddo 
and we could call the valley that these mount that this and we could call the, the the valley that was formed by these mountains the Valley of Megiddo, right? Anciently. And farther to the south was Jerusalem, a fourth mountain, the Mount of the Congregation. So we have really four mountains here, but three of those mountains form this valley. Uh, to the west of the Valley of Megiddo is the mountain called Mount Carmel. That, that's on the west of the valley, Mount Carmel. I'll use this for the west. As I'm looking at you, west is this way. Okay. We know quite a bit about, about this mountain. First Kings 18 has something to say about it. All the people were gathered there. Most of them were enemies of God. There were 450 priests of Baal there. Jezebel was there and Ahab was there. And most of the people that comprised the church were there as well. But they had been convinced to, to worship Baal. They had changed gods. Even though they were mostly the church, 450 prophets of Baal, but there were at least 7,000 who had never bowed the knee to Baal. They were there too. All gathered from the valley to the mountain on the west side of this valley at the northwest corner of Palestine. That's where this Mount Carmel is. If you look on a map, if you have a Bible, have it's a map, you can look at it, it's right there, uh, just to the west of the Sea of Galilee. Mount Carmel might be known as the mountain of decision. Elijah had a message for them that day, just like the church has a message for the world today. Not unlike Noah's message, or John the Baptist's message. Elijah was, was pictured by the evil one to be the cause of all the trouble. After all, there had been no rain for three and a half years. A desperate famine in Palestine. And Ahab accused Elijah of being the troublemaker. Not only a famine for bread, but a tremendous famine for hearing the words of the Lord because the nation had changed God's. And they were listening to the prophets of Baal. So there was a, a famine for the words of the Lord. They were being taught a false gospel. And really that's worse than no gospel at all. It'd be better not to have a gospel at all, right? Than to have a false gospel. We all need to be very careful about our understanding of the Bible gospel. We've talked about it here in the last few sermons. A new thing. So Elijah provides a message called the Elijah message to those people gathered there at Mount Carmel. It's a clarion call to God's word. Notice Elijah's message. Let's turn to it in 1 Kings chapter 18, 20 and 21. 1 Kings 18, 20 and 21. This is in the Old Testament, after Samuel. 1 Kings 18, 20 and 21. Say amen if you found it. Wow, you're ahead of me. Here's what it says. Verse 20. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, this was Elijah's message. This is the message in the end time as well. This was Elijah's message. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be Lord, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. Now, who's he talking to here? He's talking to the church. And the people answered him not a word. Only two sides here, two opinions in the end. Those represented by Elijah's message, and those allied with the 450 prophets of Baal and Jezebel and Ahab. A false gospel, a false Sabbath. By the way, in the Old Testament Baal worship, it's allied with sun worship. This is what happened there. And the devilish immor immorality that oft often accompanied it, accompanied it. Often among God's people in the Old Testament church, sun worship overshadowed the true Sabbath of the Lord. Often. 
You know, in the Old Testament, it's interesting to read that God had a controversy with the church often over two issues. They weren't taking care of the widows and the fatherless and the, and the underprivileged. They weren't taking care of them, and they were breaking the Sabbath. Those are the two things that stand out again and again and again in the Old Testament. Now, Carmel is on the western side of this valley called Megiddo, right? On the eastern side, over here, was another mountain. And uh, <clears throat> it was east of the Carmel Range of Mountains, and that mountain is Mount Tabor. Have you ever heard of that? Mount Tabor. In Portland, there's an Adventist church called the Mount Tabor Church. Great name for a church, I think. It's about 30 miles east of Mount Carmel. And remember, there's a valley between them called the Valley of Megiddo. <clears throat> Mount Tabor is thought to be the mountain where Jesus chose to be transfigured with Moses and Elijah. Mount Tabor. He took the disciples to this mountain, and he was transfigured before, before three of them. He took three of, the, three, three of them with him, and he's transfigured there. Moses and Elijah, and Jesus. What a combination. Glorified with bodies of light before the three disciples. Their eyes are as big as cantaloupes as they're watching this, right? <laughs> they can't believe what they're seeing. In fact, they get so excited, we, we need to build three tabernacles here because, because of this. <laughs> they were taken away with the scene. These three, Moses and Elijah and Jesus, represent truth. Mount Carmel is the, is, the, is the mountain of decision, right? They've all brought a decision. Across the valley, the Megiddo Valley, is the Mount Tabor. And that's the mountain of truth. So what is truth? Moses represents what part of the Bible? The law, okay. Um, is the law truth? Indeed, in Deuteronomy 4, it says that the law is the, is the covenant, that's very great truth. The sacred covenant between God and his people. And yes, indeed. Elijah represents the testimony of the prophets. You have Moses, the law. Elijah represents the testimony of the prophets. You know, the Bible says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's what? No light in them. Mount Tabor. Revelation 19.10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. His testimony, his witness, is that truth? Indeed it is. The testimony of the prophecy is about Jesus. That's why we study the book of Revelation. That's why we study Daniel and all the other prophets of the Bible. Because they're, they constitute Christ's personal testimony to us. What an idea. Is that truth? Law and testimony here. That's the Bible. That's what the Bible is. The law and the testimony. You'll find, you'll find uh, the law scattered all through the Bible. The imperatives, the things that we should observe, okay, that tell us that we're sinners so we can go to Christ for forgiveness. That's the law. The testimony of Jesus is the gospel. You'll find that scattered all through the Bible, too. Sometimes within the same verse, you'll find the gospel and the law right side by side. They're partners because we need them both. And then the third one on the Mount Tabor that day was Jesus. He's transfigured there, too. Now, he had a body like ours, right? But when he appears with Moses and Elijah, he's a glorified body, now, clothed with light. And... Uh, you know, this represents the gospel. Hanging on the cross, Jesus is the gospel. What we find in the cross is the, is the character of Jesus. It's, his, it's where he really lives. That's what he loved. That's what he, what he is to us. The gospel is all about his love. He's the good news of salvation. Is that truth? This is the mountain of truth. Three beings on the mountain transfigured before the disciples. And for us as well. Jesus is indeed the way, the truth, and the life. So these three, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, in the presence of three disciples, 
Because of time, I won't read that incident because uh, Wayne so nicely read it for us already in our scripture reading this morning. A description, the Bible description of the transfiguration. Mount Tabor is a symbol of truth. So Mount Carmel, over here, the mountain of decision, the valley of Megiddo between them, which is a really a valley where a lot of battles and bloodshed took place. And on the other side of the valley is the mountain of truth. Now to the south of Mount Tabor, there's another mountain. It's about 20 miles south. I took my little, my little ruler and I looked at a map and looked at the signal how, how, how far an inch is. About 20 miles to the, mouth of, to the south of Tabor, of the Tabor Range, about 20 miles away is another mountain and it's called Mount Gilboa. Mount Gilboa, have you heard of that mountain? If we know very much about the Old Testament, we realize that Mount Gilboa is where King Saul went to visit the witch of Endor. Endor is a little town right at the foot of that mountain. Now we know what that is all about, don't we? The witch of Endor? Eastern side of the valley of Megiddo. Mount Gilboa is thought to be that place. Satan's, mes mes Satan's message that way, prophets of that day, prophets of Baal, mountain of gloom, superstition, discontent, death, mountain of death. So we have over here Mount Carmel, the Mount of Decision, the valley. Then we have Mount Tabor, the mountain of truth. And to the south of that, helping form that valley, is that mountain ridge where Gilboa is located, the mountain of death. Interesting stuff here. That's what this final battle is all going to be over. Between this, these mountains is the valley of Megiddo. Earth's final battle. Armageddon. A final conflict between Christ and Satan, but let me emphasize this is a worldwide conflict using Palestinian expressions to help us understand. It's not a battle in a little, in a little valley someplace. There's seven billion people on the earth and all the world is summoned to this battle and you can't put seven billion people in a little valley. This is a worldwide conflict, primarily a spiritual battle for earth's billions in the end time. All the world will be summoned there. I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Joel. Uh, Joel, the third chapter. We often read Joel verse two, chapter two, I'm sorry. But uh, Joel three has a lot of descriptive, descriptive things in it about, uh, the, about the final. It's uh, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. If you've been studying Daniel very much, the Bible will fall open to Daniel, and then you can find Hosea and then Joel, Joel chapter 3. Say amen if you have it. Joel chapter 3, verses, verses uh, 2 and 13 and 14. It says, I will gather, this is verse 2 now, Joel 3. I will also gather all nations and will come and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's where these battles were fought, this valley, the valley of Jehoshaphat. And will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And then verses 13 and 14. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, and the vats overflow, for the wickedness is great. Multitudes, what's the next word? Multitudes, for, this, is, this is for emphasis here. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Worldwide. You know, this is a battle for the mind. It's for your mind and my mind. Between, behind our forehead is where we really live and where important decisions are made. And on Mount Carmel that day, 
It was decisions made. In this end time battle, you see, that situation in the Old Testament is a type or an example of the great end time battle that involves the whole world. In this end time battle, not a geographical location in the Middle East, but these mountains and this valley are Old Testament symbols of loyalty to God or loyalty to rebellion, one or the other. Not, there's not a middle of the road here. Either we are rebelling against God or we are with, or, or we are with him. This is not to say that there won't be bloodshed in the end time. There will be. There will be bloodshed. But primarily a spiritual battle between good and evil. Revelation is the antitype of many Old Testament stories and ideas. Besides seven billion people, we'll make a decision all over the world. As we mentioned, it could never fit into that little Palestinian valley, that valley of blood. This last battle is worldwide. Brace yourselves for this because we will soon see an end time repeat of all of this. Just before Jesus comes, let's look at it. Revelation 16, 14 to 16. We've been here before, but now that we've said a few things, I'd like to re read it again. Revelation 16, 14 to 16. Revelation 16, 14 to 16. For they are the spirits of devils, we talked about Mount Gilboa, didn't we? Spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world and to gather them to the battle of the great day of all God Almighty. Behold, I come as a what? What does it say? Thief. We talked about that earlier. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. In ancient times, the king of the north, or the power that was, was trying to destroy Israel would come in from the north through that valley, okay? And the armies of, of Israel would go up and meet that army, and often those battles were right there in that pass between these mountain ranges. This, gather, this, this valley was the gateway to Palestine, Palestine from the north. Most of the enemies of Israel came in from the north. And Israel in the Old Testament is a symbol of what? The church in the New Testament. So what the devil wants to do in the end of time is destroy the church. He's the great king of the north. And God would often bring about a great victory for his people. But in the final battle, God's people scattered all over the world in the day of test, Will they be victorious? We read about it, read a text that said that there is a multitude which no man can number stand on the sea of glass that have gone through this terrible time of trouble. It says that they don't go hungry anymore. They're not thirsting anymore. They're in heaven, right? Standing before the throne. Great victory wrought and great Babylon will fall physically. And we can read about that in Revelation 16, 17 to 21. It falls into three, in three parts. Why does God refer to Megiddo here? Those Old Testament battles were a symbol or a type of the great conflict between good and evil. This prophecy in Revelation is not about a little valley of blood in the Middle East, but becomes a last day end time issue, a worldwide battle, a spiritual battle primarily as real as any battle that's ever been fought, but worldwide. Who are the ultimate kings of the East? <clears throat> the ultimate kings of the East. You remember it talks about, in that prophecy that we read in Revelation 16, it talks about the river Euphrates being dried up. What does water represent in prophecy? Peoples and nations. And <clears throat> Babylon is supported by what? People. Anciently, the river Euphrates ran through the city of Babylon, and the river brought what? It brought water for the gardens, the hanging gardens of Babylon. One of the, 
one of the ancient world, uh, one of the, what's the word I want to say? Seven wonders of the ancient world, right? And uh, Babylon had fruitful gardens. That's what they lived on. But water in the end time represents what? Peoples. You can read about that in Revelation 17, 15. We talked about that one night, I think. Uh, who comes like a thief? <laughs> in that ancient fall of Babylon in Daniel, Cyrus the Persian came with other kings of the east with him, and he came to Babylon like a thief in the night. And he took over Babylon. Belshazzar was having a, a drunken party, with a, it says, with a thousand of his lords. And Cyrus diverted the Euphrates River, which ran through the city, the river of support, that ran through the city of Babylon. And those kings of the east under Cyrus went through on the, the riverbed because they diverted the river to another area, made a lake out of it, and diverted the river and the armies of Cyrus and the other kings of the east that came with him, and they overthrew the city that night, like a thief in the night. Took him totally by surprise. Belshazzar the king was killed and a whole bunch of other people. The next morning, you know what happened? The Israelites who were captives in Babylon threw their hats in the air and they said, Babylon has fallen. <laughs> it was the sign of their release to go back home to Jerusalem. It was a joyful time. But in the end time, God's people are still ready, waiting, waiting, waiting for that same kind of a deliverance. Babylon will come to an end, and God's people will be delivered when Jesus comes. This is the final battle. Cyrus is a type of Christ. In fact, Jesus is our great Cyrus, <laughs> the ultimate king of the East. Jesus is our great Cyrus with, the armies, with his armies of true believers. And they will make a short work in this final battle. The Bible says the last moments, movements will be what? Rapid ones. You all know about this, don't you? The last movements will be rapid ones. I'd like to have you notice with me Revelation 17, verses 12 to 14. Revelation 17. Verses 7, um, 12 to 14. Here are the real kings of the East. This is the real thing now. Cyrus and his eastern kings that came and overthrew ancient Babylon, they were the type or the example of what happens in reality in the end time. Revelation 17, 12 to 14. You have it? It says, uh, verse 12, and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with a beast. Lamont, we stopped just short of this the other night. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength to the beast. These shall make war with the what? Lamb. Who's the lamb? Jesus. And the lamb shall what? Overcome them. This is the battle of Armageddon. This is the real thing. For he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, kings of the east, and, with, and they that are with him are called what? Chosen and faithful. Here are the kings of the east, coming with the great king of the east, our great Cyrus, as Babylon is finally overthrown, and Jesus comes. What an idea. Here are the real end time kings of the east. If I had time this morning, I'd read Jeremiah 51, um, using these Old Testament expressions. They go out and they call, come out of her, my people. You read about that in Jeremiah. It almost reads it like Revelation 18. Jeremiah, the Old Testament. Revelation 18. Almost reads like that. Maybe... Maybe I'll just go ahead and read it anyway. Let's, let's turn to it. Revelation 15. It kind of falls flat unless we read it. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51.
1, 2, and 4 to 6. See if you can read this in Revelation. This, this, this comes out real clear in Revelation. Jeremiah 51, 1 and 2. Remember, the Old Testament is a, is a type of what happens in the book of Revelation. Verses 1 and 2. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon, against them that dwell in the midst of them, that rise up against me, a destroying wind. And I will send unto Babylon fanners, and they shall fan her, and shall empty her land, for in a day of trouble there shall be a, they, they shall be against her round about. And I want to drop down to verses 4 to 6. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans, and they that are thrust through in her streets. For Israel hath been forsaken. Is, is, Israel hath not been forsaken. Don't think that God is going to forsake his church in the end time. Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts through their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Flee out of the midst of Babylon. You know, in Revelation 18, verse 4, it says, come out of her, my people. This is a type of the final end time call for people out of Babylon. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off of her iniquities. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Using Old Testament expressions, symbols of a last day reality, Flee from the midst of Babylon and Babylonish ideas which proclaim a false gospel and a false Sabbath. Now let's look at verses 7 to 9. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Verse 7. This is Jeremiah 51 verse 7. That made the earth drunken. The nations have drunken her wine. Therefore the nations are mad. You remember Revelation, reading in Revelation 17 about this golden cup in her hand and making the nations drunk? This happened in the Old Testament type or example of what happens in reality in the end time. Verse 8, Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. Howl for her, take balm for her pain. If so, she be, may, if so be, she may be healed. Now, the majority of God's people are in Babylon today. And many of them will be healed, and they will come out at the call, come out of Babylon, my people. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her. Let us go, every one to his own country, for her judgment reaches to heaven. In Revelation 18, it says her sins have reached to heaven. Almost reads like Revelation 18. This is the type. Revelation is the antitype. At... Uh, that day, the key people of God will have a role in vindicating God's character. Remember, these are the kings of the east. Let's look at it. Jeremiah 51, verse 19. The por portion of Jacob, that's talking about the church now. This is the type. Now let's think about, about the end time church. The portion of Jacob is not like them. For he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. And then notice what he says. Thou art my battle axe and what? Weapons of war. <laughs> These are the kings of the east. These are God's people, okay, in the end time. And with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. That's what the message of three angels will do. And with thee I will break in pieces the horse and his rider. And with thee I will break in pieces the chariot and his rider. And with thee will I break in pieces man and woman. And with thee I will break in pieces old and young. And with thee I will break in pieces the young man and the maid. <clears throat> I will break in pieces with, with thee the shepherd of his flock. And with thee will I break in pieces the husband and his yoke of oxen. And with thee will I break in pieces... This is the destiny of the church. This is the power of the third angel's message. 
And I will render unto Babylon and all her, the inhabitants of the Chaldeans all their evil which they have done in Zion in your sight, saith the Lord. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyest all the earth. I will stretch out my hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and will make thee a burnt mountain. God's people. These are the kings of the east. We believe a we will, it will, God's church will be like a new sharp thrashing instrument. And the two-edged sword is the word of God. Hebrews 4 verse 12. Our appeal this morning, I guess, where do you want to be in all of this? This end time conflict will be over God's Sabbath. The sealing angel comes from where? The east. Kings of the East put these things together in the book of Revelation because Revelation is the antitype of the Old Testament. The sealing message is all about the Sabbath. God's will is that we be like those 7,000 who were the Elijah on Mount Carmel who had not bowed the knee to Baal. 7,000 who were not bowing, to those, not bowing with those sun worshipers. We need to make that covenant decision today so that our lives will be hid with God in Christ, the one who is our life. We do the decision and God produces the, the horsepower and fire comes from heaven in that day. You know, in the time of Elijah on the mountain, the, the prophets of Baal couldn't bring down the fire. But in the end time, it says fire comes in Revelation 13. And where does it come from? It comes from the devil. There'll be a false fire. Here's another type of the last battle. The power is in the Elijah message, the message of four angels. It's a battle for your heart and my heart. It's all about the final disposition of sin on this planet. God gathers the whole world to the valley of death. The mountains all around are symbols of the decisions that we make today, every day. Those forces are gathering even now. When we get down to Armageddon, it's all over with. It's under the seventh plague, sixth plague, I'm sorry. I can picture the Father God with tears in his eyes as he asks us, what will you do with my son? What will you do with my son? That's really what it's all about. What reason could any of us give for refusing a God like that? And I'm wondering if we could covenant here at the beginning of a brand new year, a clean year, to make a lifelong pilgrimage to Mount Tabor by making it a principle in our lives to seek the Lord with all diligence, by spending time with him, getting to know him. Tabor is the mountain of truth. And uh, that's the appeal this morning. While most of the world retreats to Mount Gilboa, the mountain of deception, where the dragon and the beast and the false prophet are holed up, and perform false, false miracles that deceives the people. Spiritualism is quickly becoming a very spiritual fad in our world today. I don't know how many of you watch television a little bit, maybe a little bit, but uh, watch the world around you. Spiritualism is becoming the fad of the day. That mountain looks like a volcano, volcano of false fire. Final decisions come from Mount Carmel where the true fire falls in latter rain power, I can almost hear the rain beginning to fall from heaven. And we see a little cloud about the size of a man's hand, an allusion to 1 Kings chapter 18. And a new day dawns as the redeemed of all the ages rise in the first resurrection, their Father in heaven. We pray and we plead for the showers of the Holy Spirit, which become the power behind the final gospel message to the world before Jesus comes. I pray, Lord, that we might ally ourselves with, with Jesus, our real Cyrus, so that we can qualify to be kings of the East with him as the new sharp thrashing instrument begins to do its work in the earth. Pray, Lord, that you will be with each of us here that today um, I think of the family this morning of Richard Schilling. Pray that you'll be with them in great comfort this morning. 
please uh, assist us to our homes. And as we go into this new year, this new week, I should say, and this new year, new and uncertain year, I pray that you will be with us and go with us. Please be, bless each one today according to our several needs, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.